Welcome to In The Workshop. This is part two of how to repair a Stuart Models 10V steam engine. In part one I showed how I initially got the engine to run properly. Now it's time to do some little repairs that make all the difference. Starting with the inlet piping. This leaks and it's soft soldered, so it needs to be cleaned up and silver soldered. In this clip I'm using the Stanley knife blade to clean off some sort of sealant that's been applied there in the past. And now I'm about to use the airline to blow away any traces of sealant that may have got into the steam chest. Then I put my finger over the hole in the other side of the steam chest where the displacement lubricator was and blasted some air into the engine just to make sure that it still runs well. I'm going to clean up the flywheel. This is not really part of the job, but if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing properly. And it's a very nice little engine is this. It doesn't look much, but believe me, it's very well made. In this clip, I'm refinishing the steam chest cover on a piece of emery cloth. Then I took the steam chest cover, turned it over and pressed it against my ink pad. Then I pressed the steam chest cover, ink side down of course, onto a piece of gasket material, because the original gasket wasn't very good, so I'm making a new gasket for the steam chest. And when I lifted the steam chest off the piece of gasket material, there was a clearly visible image, which allowed me to first of all punch some holes to fit the studs, then I cut out the gasket with a pair of scissors. And the final job that really I should have done before this one is I cut out the centre of the gasket using a very sharp scalpel, taking great care not to disembowel myself in the process. This scalpel's really sharp, it's a very nasty thing really, but I do like using it because when I was younger I had aspirations to be a surgeon, I really fancied the idea of cutting people up when they were asleep but I became a musician instead. Here's the gasket fitted to the steam chest, ready to accept the steam chest cover that I've been cleaning up. And now the engine looks like this. And as the steam chest cleaned up so well, I couldn't fit the old nuts in place, so here are four brand new 7BA nuts. And now to my eye, that looks altogether much better. Now it's time to fix this. It's the steam inlet manifold. It's soft soldered and it leaks, so it's time to do something with it. And the first part of this job is to remove the fitting from the end of the pipe. And as you can see from this clip, all I had to do was heat it up with my blowtorch to melt the solder. And the good news is, there wasn't much solder actually stuck to the metal anyway. The next part of the job was just to turn the pipe round and unsolder the steam union cone. This was also soft soldered and came off very easily as soon as I warmed it up with the blowtorch. As you can see from this image on screen at the moment, the union cone was actually properly soldered to the pipe, but soft solder for live steam pipes is not a good idea. This is a very important part of the job. Silver solder and soft solder do not mix. If a piece of copper pipe has been soft soldered, before silver soldering the pipe, every trace, and I mean every trace of the soft solder, needs to be removed. I used emery cloth first, followed by Scotch-Brite, followed by using the polishing spindle. And soon every trace of the soft solder was gone from the pipe. And the pipe is now very nice and shiny, but I don't need it to be nice and shiny at this stage, so I'm just roughening it up with some Scotch-Brite. Normally I would do both ends of a piece of pipe in one go, but for the purposes of the video I'm going to split it. And if this happens, I did that on purpose by the way, if you get any silver solder flux down the pipe, blow down the end of the pipe to get rid of it. The silver solder flux needs to be just around the outside edge of the pipe, because generally speaking the silver solder will try and flow wherever it sees the flux. The piece of stainless steel fire grate that I use is very useful for propping things up in the right position when I'm silver soldering in the vise. These components are going to be heated very shortly to red heat, so it's most important that they are firmly positioned before the soldering process can begin. Before I turn on the blowtorch though, I'm just applying a little bit more flux to the end of the brass fitting. And now it's blowtorch time. I'm heating the parts to the correct temperature and only when the parts have reached this correct temperature will I apply the silver solder. I'm hovering near the part with the silver solder but it's not as close to the flame as it looks in the video, that's just the camera angle. The yellow flame you can see is some oil burning off the fitting. 
I'm waiting for the temperature to reach such a level that first of all the yellow flame disappears. Then once the silver solder flux takes on a watery appearance, all I have to do is just touch the joint with my piece of silver solder wire and the silver solder flashes around the joint and the job is done. The next thing to do is to let the part cool to black and dip it in some cold water to cool it, then remove it. The thermal shock will remove some of the scale, but not all of it. Usually I would put parts like this in my acid bath, but my acid bath is in use at the moment and it's hardly worth it anyway. I can clean this up on the polishing spindle perfectly fine. Sometimes you will find that you get a problem with silver solder flux. It forms a diamond hard deposit on the metal. The acid bath removes this deposit, but without the acid bath I have to use a needle file to remove it before repolishing. The technique for silver soldering the steam cone onto the other end of the pipe is very, very straightforward. There is one thing though that's very much worth mentioning when silver soldering union cones onto copper piping. Always put the union nut on the pipe first. I did put the union nut on the pipe, it's just that you can't see it in the previous clip because it was at the other end of the pipe out of the way of the heat. A last touch on the polishing spindle and that's the inlet pipe made. Using my backhoe spanner and a shim washer and some Loctite 542, I screwed the fitting into the right hand side of the steam chest where the displacement lubricator was originally fitted and the displacement lubricator is now being fitted at the other side. If you're doing these sort of jobs, you definitely need shim washers. This is not full size engineering. You cannot put a lot of pressure on the parts. They will break. Small packs of shim washers of varying sizes and thickness are available from my friends at Blackgates Engineering and their web address is on screen at the moment. By selecting the correct sizes of shim washers, you can fit parts like this very easily. On the second attempt, this washer was no good either, but the third time, with the correct size shim washer fitted, I didn't have a problem. Once I screw the displacement lubricator into the steam chest, it goes all the way around and ends up in the right position without too much pressure. When I received this engine, there wasn't an exhaust pipe with it, although I've since spoken to the owner who says he does have one, but by that time I'd already made this one. Very simple to do, thread the end of the piece of copper piping, which was bent in the first place, chamfer the end, and then screw it into the exhaust port. So here's the engine running quite well, but the timing needs a bit of attention and unfortunately this grub screw is broken so I'm removing it and discarding it. I'm removing it with a pair of pliers and I'm very carefully fitting a new grub screw with a screwdriver. This is a 7BA slotted grub screw and they're very easily broken so you must never put too much pressure on the slot itself. Once again there is a fine line, well it's not so fine really, it's quite a chasm, it's quite like a Grand Canyon between model engineering and engineering on full-size steam engines. I was watching an engineer doing just that the other day. He was applying full-size techniques to a model engine. I'm not going to go into any specific details, but it made me cringe watching him work. So with the help of this newly fitted grub screw, I'm going to set the engine's timing. Up to a point, this part of the job is more of an art than a science. As a general rule, you need to start off with the highest point of the eccentric at 90 degrees to the crank web. And depending which side of the crank web the eccentric is set to be at 90 degrees to, depends in which direction the engine rotates. So here's the full procedure. Initially set the eccentric sheave to 90 degrees to the crank web and then run the engine. Don't put much pressure into the engine, just a little bit. And what you're interested in is at which point the steam is admitted to the cylinder, or in this case, compressed air. Normally, you would want early admission. Not too early, otherwise the engine won't run at all. But you certainly don't want it too late. If it's admitting the air or steam after the crankshaft has left top dead centre, then that's not good. But sometimes you have to live with that, and that's down to the shape and size of the valve. It's a little bit of trial and error but try not to get too anal about it, otherwise you can spend many hours going back and forth and you end up back at the same place anyway. So I think the owner of this engine should be quite pleased with the repair and I'll be posting it back to Glasgow the middle of next week. I'm going to leave the engine running to the end of the video and just let you watch the poetry in motion, which is a steam engine. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.